Hello, my name is Daniel and I teach chemistry at the University of Glasgow. In this unit we'll explore the concept of an isotopologue and look at its implications for NMR spectroscopy. The word isotopologue is related to the word isotope. Atoms are described as isotopic if they contain the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons in their nuclei. Thus a particular element may exist with a number of different isotopic forms. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. If we consider the first element, hydrogen. By definition, the nuclei of all hydrogen atoms contain one and only one proton. Most hydrogen atoms are the isotope of hydrogen with just one proton and no neutrons in its nucleus. We call this the 1H isotope, but it is also known as protium. There is another stable isotope of hydrogen. It has one proton and one neutron in the nucleus. We call it the 2H isotope. It also has another name and it is known as deuterium. The protium isotope is much more abundant than the deuterium. Only about one in 7,000 hydrogen atoms is deuterium. The rest are all protium. A similar situation exists for the element carbon. There are just two stable isotopes of carbon. Most carbon atoms are carbon-12. This isotope has six protons and six neutrons in its nucleus. But sometimes a carbon atom is the isotope carbon-13, which has six protons and seven neutrons in its nucleus. Carbon-13 has a natural abundance of about 1%. That means only one in a hundred carbon atoms is carbon-13. The rest are all the carbon-12 isotope. For the most part, the chemistry of an element is determined by the electronic structure of its atoms, which in turn is determined by the electrostatic potential caused by the protons in the nucleus. Different elements have different numbers of protons, giving different electrostatic potentials, resulting in different electronic configurations and different chemistry. Different isotopes of the same element have the same number of protons, giving them the same electrostatic potential, resulting in the same electronic configuration and the same chemistry. However, there are some occasions when the different isotopes have significant effects on a material property or behaviour. It should be no surprise that the spectra obtained by nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy, are profoundly affected by the presence of different isotopes. Different isotopes of the same element will have different nuclear magnetic moments. Given that elements often exist in more than one isotopic form, we should expect in molecules and compounds to find that different isotopes of an element are randomly distributed. We would say that two molecules, which have identical chemical structures, are isotopologues if they do not have identical distributions of all of the isotopes present in the molecule. I want to consider the very simple compound of methane. With a CH4 composition, it is made of just five atoms, a central carbon and four peripheral hydrogen atoms, arranged in a tetrahedral geometry. We know that carbon can be carbon-12 or carbon-13. We know that hydrogen can be protium or deuterium. By a systematic variation, we can determine all the possible isotopologues of methane that we might find in a natural sample. We could have a methane molecule with a carbon-12 and four protium atoms. Alternatively, we could have an isotopologue with a carbon-13 and four protium atoms. We could have a carbon-12 three protium atoms and one deuterium atom. We could have a carbon-13, three protium and one deuterium atom. Of course, we could have a carbon-12 with two proteums, two deuteriums, or that could be a carbon-13 with two proteums and two deuteriums. Or it could be carbon-12 with three deuteriums and one proteum, or carbon-13 with three deuteriums and one proteum. Or it could be carbon-12 and four deuteriums. 
or carbon-13 and four deuterium atoms. These ten possibilities are the ten isotopologues of methane. And in a natural sample, you would expect to find all of them. I want to begin to think about a hypothetical NMR experiment on a sample of methane. Different isotopes have different nuclear spin moments, and each different isotopologue may give a different NMR spectrum. From our knowledge of the natural abundances of different isotopes, we can determine the natural proportions of each of the isotopologues in our sample. The probability of a molecule being a particular isotopologue is the product of the probabilities of each of the atoms being what it is, times the number of ways that there are to form that particular isotopologue. For example, the probability that a methane molecule has one carbon-12 atom and four proteum atoms is the probability that the carbon is carbon-12 times the probability that the first hydrogen is a proton times the probability that the second hydrogen is a proton times the probability that the third hydrogen is a proton times the probability that the fourth hydrogen is a proton. And this is close to 99%. For the isotopologue with a carbon-13 atom, the probability is close to 1%. We can calculate the probability for the other isotopologues, but the rarity of the deuterium isotope makes their abundance much, much less. For our NMR experiment, most of the signal will come from the most abundant species. So from a practical perspective, we can ignore all the deuterium-containing molecules. Now let's consider the proton NMR spectrum of our sample of methane. Each isotopologue that contains a proton will give an NMR signal. And the spectrum we observe will be a superposition of all the spectra of each isotopologue weighed by its abundance. The first isotopologue, the most abundant one, is the one with one carbon atom and four proteum atoms. This makes up the bulk of the sample. The tetrahedral geometry ensure all hydrogen are in the same chemical environment, and we expect a single signal. And since atoms in the same environment don't couple to each other, and since the central atom is carbon-12, which has no nuclear spin moment, we can expect the signal to remain a singlet. The next most abundant isotopologue has a carbon-13 atom and four proteum atoms. Again, by symmetry, each hydrogen is in the same chemical environment and will have identical chemical shifts. So a single peak with a chemical shift that is very, very close to that of the first isotopologue. However, in this molecule, the carbon-13 atom has a nuclear spin. I equals a half. That means that the Mi values take plus a half and minus a half. And this will split the signal into a doublet. And the splitting will be the one bond carbon-13 to proton coupling constant. Our observed spectra will be the superposition of these two subspectra. A big dominant peak with two smaller satellite peaks. Now, let's consider a slightly more complicated molecule. Tetramethyl tin has a central tin atom bound to four chemically equivalent methyl groups. This two-dimensional schematic shows the bond connectivity. We know about the isotopes of hydrogen and that we can ignore the rare deuterium isotope. We know about the isotopes of carbon, mostly it's non-magnetic carbon-12, but about 1% of carbon is carbon-13, which has a nuclear spin of I equal a half. In this molecule, we have one atom of the element tin, and we need to look up in a data book what isotopes of tin exist and what their natural abundances are. For an NMR experiment, we should also like to know about their nuclear spin moments. And the first thing we have to find out about here is the value of the nuclear spin momentum quantum number I. Now, the lightest stable tin atom is tin 112, and the heaviest stable tin atom is tin 124. All the isotopes in between are known, but tin 113, 121 and tin 123 are all unstable and are radioactive. 
and have zero natural abundance. If we look at the value of the nuclear spin quantum number for each isotope, we notice it is zero for all isotopes with an even mass. This is part of a general pattern. Nucleides with even numbers of protons and with even numbers of neutrons always have zero nuclear spin moment. So in this particular case, tin 112, tin 114, tin 116, tin 118, tin 120, tin 122 and tin 124 all have I equal to zero. These nuclei are NMR inactive and they cannot couple to other nuclei in the molecule. From an NMR perspective, we can treat isotopologues containing any one of these spin zero tin atoms as if they were the same. For these isotopes, we'll group them together and we'll label them as asterisk tin isotopes. Together, these account for 83% of the tin nuclei. That leaves three isotopes, each of which has a nuclear spin of one half. The tin, 119, is the most abundant at 8.6%, but tin 117 is almost as important with a 7.7% abundance. And then tin 115 is present, but much less significant. It accounts only for 0.4% of all tin. So let's have a look at the proton NMR of tetramethyl tin. In each molecule, all hydrogen atoms are in the same chemical environment. There should be one signal. And if we ignore the carbon and the tin for now, the atoms are all in the same environment and don't couple to each other. And so we should expect a single signal and that to be a single peak, a singlet. That is sort of what we observe, but not quite. There are features that are equally displaced from the central peak. But this is not a triplet. This is not the familiar one to two to one binomial triplet that we often observe. If we zoom in by stretching the y-axis, we can see these weaker features in much more detail. And now to make sense of these, we need to consider the NMR spectrum of the most abundant isotopologues. The most abundant species have all hydrogens as 1H, protium, all carbon as non-magnetic carbon-12, and a tin atom that is in the group of non-magnetic isotopes, with all with zero nuclear spin. In this case, we can expect a single singlet marked in red as the main feature. The next most significant isotopologue now has tin 119 at its centre. This spin one half isotope will couple to the protons and split the signal into a doublet, the centre of which will be in the same place as that of the singlet. If we look for the next biggest feature, we see a doublet marked in green. The separation of these two lines gives the two bond tin 119 to proton coupling constant. OK, but there are still more features to explain. So the next most abundant isotopologue has tin 117 at its centre. Tin 117 is only slightly less abundant than tin 119. And tin 117 also has a spin one half nucleus. And in molecules where tin 117 is at the centre, the proton NMR signal will be split into a doublet. And that is what we observe. The next biggest feature is a doublet marked in blue. The separation of these lines gives us the two bond tin 117 to proton coupling constant. Now, since we're thinking about isotopologues with different tin isomers, there is an isotopologue with tin 115 at the centre. This is a spin one half nuclei and it will split the proton signal into a doublet but this species is quite rare. Based upon the experimental integrated intensities, we can assign these peaks to the small satellite peaks in yellow. Of course, the separation of these two lines gives us the two bond tin 115 to proton coupling constant. So far, we have accounted for most, but not all of the features. We need to think about other possible isotopologues. We've exhausted the tin isotopes, and for hydrogen, the 2H deuterium isotope is really rather rare. However, for carbon, while most carbon is carbon-12, there is about a 1% chance of a carbon being carbon-13. This is a higher chance than of tin being tin-115. Moreover, in this molecule, tetramethyl tin, 
the chance of any one of the four methyl groups containing a carbon-13 atom is higher still. So what should we expect from the proton NMR of a molecule where we have all 12 hydrogens as protein, the tin as one of the non-magnetic tin isotopes, and one methyl carbon as carbon-13, while the other three methyl groups all have a carbon-12? Well, the three protons bonded to the carbon-13 will be split by a one bond carbon-13 to proton coupling into a doublet. The remaining nine protons bonded to carbon-12 containing methyl groups will couple much more weakly to the carbon-13 since it's much further away. They will still be split into doublets but with a much smaller three bond coupling constant. This prediction is coloured in purple. And this is what we've actually observed, except that the three bond carbon-13 to proton coupling constant is so small that the signals are hidden under the main peak of the most abundant isotopologue. So by considering all the isotopologues, their abundances and their individual NMR spectra, we get a pretty good match to the observed NMR spectra. So that seems like the whole story, but there's one more aspect to this spectroscopic assignment that is useful to consider. There are a number of complex factors that contribute to the size of a coupling constant, not least the electron distributions in a molecule, so coupling constants can tell us about bonding. However, the coupling constant is also related to a property of the nuclei that are coupled, that is their gyromagnetic ratios. You can find these values for each isotope from a data book. Since the bonding in different isotopologues is the same, only the nuclear isotopes have changed, the ratio of the tin to proton coupling constants should match the ratio of the different gyromagnetic ratios for the different tin isotopes. This is exactly what we observe. And this is now an independent corroboration of our spectral assignment which was initially based upon the relative intensities of the different peaks. So now you know what an isotopologue is and how important they can be in some NMR spectra. Thank you for watching.